are going to get started. So um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Juliana Fenuz, and I'm a project coordinator for the Green Municipal Fund at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, also known as FCM. And today's, the web today's webinar is actually the third of a five-part series on best practices in municipal sustainability. So each week we're going to be covering a different sector, and today's session will be focusing specifically on opportunities and practices in sustainable land use. So although the webinar is offered in English, the audience is welcome to ask questions in French as well. And if you do have colleagues that are missing today's webinar, the session is also being recorded and should be online and available on our YouTube page in a few weeks. So in case you haven't attended the past sessions, I'm just going to run through very quickly on some context about the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Green Municipal Fund. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is the national voice of municipal government with lots of different programs and services that are designed to support municipalities. Our largest program is the Green Municipal Fund, also known as GMF, uh, which is a $1 billion program funded by the Government of Canada to support municipal efforts to improve air, water, and air quality. So this fund is open to municipalities, large and small, in every province and territory. Our fund has a double mission to support municipal initiatives and sustainable development through funding, but also to share knowledge and lessons learned through online resources and tools, through trainings, and through peer learning activities, as well as networking opportunities. So the Green Municipal Fund is actually available for projects in five different sectors, including waste reduction, energy performance, transportation, water performance, and brownfields, which I'll briefly talk about at the end of today's presentation. And just a few useful highlights that might be of interest to some of you. Um, we really encourage you to check out our approved projects database, which has lots of different types of information and resources on the projects that GMF funds. So this includes resources like case studies, reports, contact information, and much more. So I'd encourage you to check out a few of the links uh, that we're going to be sending through the chat box. Another point is to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, FCM Connect, for the latest updates on funding, training, and, on, and more on what we have to offer today. We also strongly encourage you to apply to FCM's 2020 Sustainable Communities Awards before the March 31st deadline. These awards are great because they recognize Canada's most innovative local sustainability projects in nine different categories, and we'll be sending you a link for more information on that. Which also reminds me, you should all come and join local leaders across the country for FCM's 2020 Sustainable Communities Conference, which is taking place October 20th to 22nd in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. This is a landmark opportunity to celebrate GMF's 20th anniversary and the program should deliver relevant content that brings fresh insights to community challenges. And you'll also benefit from in-depth knowledge on how to access GMF's new funding offer coming out this spring. So registration for that opens on March 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. Which brings us to today's special. So this webinar uh, is intended to demonstrate and showcase how Canadian communities are tackling their environmental challenges by launching innovative initiatives across uh, each of the GMF set five sectors, which we've covered through, and we are covering through the series. In addition to profiling innovative initiatives in each of the sectors, these next three sessions will feature key research findings in the areas of land use, waste, and water respectively. In these webinars, you'll learn about significant municipal needs and trends in each of the sectors, as well as leading edge best practices with high true bottom line benefits and strong potential to transform municipal activities. The reports for land use, waste and water are now available online on our website in both French and English. We'll be sending you a link for that. And we're actually very fortunate to have with us today the sustainable land use research authors who will talk more about these practices. Today's session will not only shed light on the report, but we're also going to profile Edmonton City's city plan. And at the very end of the session, we'll go over a few of the GMF funding opportunities for land use. 
So we're very fortunate to be joined by our three panelists today. We have Ray Tumulti from the Smart Cities Research Services and John Perkis from Perkis Strategies, who are the lead researchers of the summary report, as well as Kaylin Anderson from the city of Edmonton. Thank you three for joining us today. And before I turn the floor over to you, there are a few housekeeping items. So Ray and John will, will present for about 15 minutes, followed by Kaylin leaving about 15 minutes or so for questions and a few minutes at the end for a quick funding overview. So please send us your questions through the questions and chat function and we'll respond to them once the presentations are over and we'll aim to get through as many of these questions as we can. So first we're gonna start off with John and Ray. John Perkis is a principal at Perkis Strategies and a senior associate with the Natural Step Canada and the Lansdowne Group. He is a sustainability expert, facilitator, and systems change specialist with 25 years of experience. He works with municipalities, businesses, and others in Canada and globally to generate and implement bold visions for a sustainable future. He is currently working on several housing solution labs across the country, and he's also one of XDM Sustainable Community Award judges. Prior to joining the Natural Step Canada, he worked with XDM where he helped lay the foundation for the Green Municipal Fund and oversaw innovative municipal planning and infrastructure projects. He has a, a degree in environmental science from Brock University and a graduate degree in business from Concordia University. We're also joined today by Ray Tumalti, who is an adjunct professor at McGill University School of Urban Planning and principal of Smart Cities Research Services. He specializes in research and policy development related to urban sustainability, including growth management, active transportation, green infrastructure, community energy and climate planning, housing affordability, fiscal issues, and urban governance. He has a PhD in urban planning from the University of Waterloo and a master's in public administration from Queen's University. So thank you both for joining us, Ray and John, or John more particularly, you should have control and be able to move through your slides. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today speaking with everyone about uh, an issue I'm uh, quite passionate about. Um, so I'm just gonna start off by making sure that my controls are working well. Uh, and so the, the research that we've done, just to touch on this basically uh, quickly at the beginning, and I'm gonna pass it over to Ray to go through methodology and our approach and some of the fantastic stories. Uh, we also worked, it's important to note for us that we also worked with Dan Wilson from the Whistler Center. Uh, he was instrumental in helping us conduct the research, um, as was a group of students from McGill University. Um, and we had a very strong panel of expert advisors and municipalities that we spoke with in, in pulling this information together. It was a particular pleasure for me having worked on a similar report uh, while I was at FCM a number of years ago. And it's also, as you'll see with the examples that we share today, and through a report, it's it's quite impressive what municipalities have accomplished over the last 20 years since I've been in, in, involved in working with communities on, on these issues. Um, I don't wanna belabor the point. We've got a lot of content to cover, uh, lots of exciting examples and stories. And I'm gonna pass it over to Ray to go through our methodology and those examples. And I'll come back and share some a couple of specific case studies uh, towards the end. Ray, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you, John, and thank you, Juliana, for the introduction. Um, so uh, the design and methodology, the report is based on research that took place in five steps. First, we conducted an online survey among planners uh, about the range of sustainability uh, land use issues they're facing. Then we identified nine strategic directions that represent the most innovative and important currents of change in our communities. Next, we identified a set of 26 best practices that support each of those uh, strategic directions. For each of the 26 best, best practices, we developed a detailed case study. And in the next step, we analyzed the best practices in terms of the potential to reduce GHG emissions and their triple bottom line benefits. And we chose 10 high impact best practices with the greatest scaling potential. We then prepared the full report from which FCM prepared the summary document, which uh, I believe is being shared with you. Um, so if we move on to the municipal issues that we found uh, on our uh, survey, um, we found that municipal officials were concerned about financial issues such as underinvestment in infrastructure, environmental issues such as adapting to extreme weather events and climate change mitigation, social issues such as affordable housing and dealing with homelessness, 
economic issues such as the lack of infrastructure to support economic growth and diversification, and built environment issues such as urban sprawl and the need to make transit and active transportation modes uh, viable alternatives to the car. So as I said, there are nine uh, strategic directions and we're gonna go through each of, uh, of those and talk about the best practices that we identified under each one. After that, John will go over some of the high impact best practices and case studies in more detail. So the first uh, st strategic direction is stemming sprawl through redevelopment and uh, intensification. And uh, the best practices, uh, as you can see, are listed under there. A nodal development strategy refers to planning efforts to concentrate development in a limited number of designated centers linked by high quality transit. And our uh, case study uh, in that, in, for that best practice was the Metro Vancouver Regional Growth Strategy, which encourages compact nodal development, particularly around SkyTrain stations. Some municipalities are encouraging intensification by setting intensification targets and promoting the small scale infill of existing low density neighborhoods. Edmonton uh, set a target for 25% of new development of new uh, dwelling units to go into the already urbanized area in its municipal development plan and adopted residential infill guidelines to encourage the gentle densification of mature neighborhoods. Um, with the new uh, transit investment that we're seeing from uh, senior governments, uh, some municipalities are working to transform car oriented streets into transit supportive corridors. Uh, for instance, Saskatoon's uh, growth corridor study is uh, one of our high impact best practices. So John's going to discuss that in, uh, in more detail uh, later in the presentation. We identified a number of communities where efforts are being made to encourage mid-density housing along main streets. Toronto's avenues and mid-rise uh, building initiative is a set of planning policies and de design guidelines that aim to encourage mid-rise development on the city's main avenues. So the next uh, strategic direction is uh, reducing environmental impacts and maximizing socio-economic benefits through neighborhood uh, site design and retrofit. So some neighborhoods, uh, some munic municipalities are experimenting with more sustainable approaches to neighborhood design, such as new urbanism and one planet living. The towns of North Cowichan and Duncan jointly created a plan that envisioned a neighborhood adjacent to a university campus as a walkable medium density growth center featuring new urbanist and green design principles. Uh, that's on Vancouver Island. Um, more attention is being paid to retrofitting existing neighborhoods to help achieve sustainability goals. One of the best examples of this in Canada is the Toronto Region Conservation Authority's Sustainable Neighborhood Action Program, which John is going to discuss uh, in detail later. Um, more communities are experimenting with carbon neutral neighborhood designs based on district heating, high performance buildings, transit connections, and walkable mixed use districts. Uh, Malmo, Sweden is home to one of Europe's first carbon uh, neutral mixed use neighborhoods called uh, Bo01, and John's gonna uh, discuss that in detail later. The third sustainable uh, uh, strategic direction is improving sustainability and quality of life through design of streets and public spaces. Um, a complete street is, a designed or retrofit, is designed or retrofitted to accommodate all users, including transit riders, pedestrians, and cyclists, in addition to cars. Quebec City's complete street strategy aims to convert 25% of city streets into complete streets and has carried out over a dozen street retrofits uh, so far. And inclusionary housing, uh, the third, the fourth uh, strategic direction is making housing more affordable and communities more equitable. Um, An inclusionary housing policy encourages developers to provide lower cost units, sometimes in exchange for incentives such as density bonusing. Uh, Montreal has an inclusionary housing policy that encourages developers to integrate affordable housing in larger residential projects through a mix of policy guidelines, regulatory tools, and economic incentives. Some municipalities are adopting comprehensive rental housing strategies to enlarge uh, the pool of affordable rental units. For instance, New, New Westminster's affordable rental strategy is doing this using a moratorium on the co conversion of rental units, density bonuses, a fast track permitting pro uh, process, and reduced parking requirements. 
A community land trust removes land from the private land market and provides a basis for permanently affordable social housing. Uh, for example, in Vancouver, a community land trust is creating 358 units of non-market rental housing on city donated land. An affordable housing joint venture is a type of PPP where a municipal housing agency works with a private sector developer to develop municipally owned land with a mix of social and market housing. Our case study was the uh, Toronto Regent Park project, uh, which is a joint venture to create a mixed tenure, mixed income and mixed use neighborhood linked to a district energy plant. And finally, under this uh, strategic direction, uh, another uh, best practice is affordable housing on donated sites near high quality transit, uh, where we see transit agencies uh, transferring surplus parcels of land to social housing providers. Um, and our uh, case study here was on the Puget Sound, uh, Sound uh, Transit Equitable Development Near Transit Stations policy, uh, where the transit provider um, had some leftover parcels near stations and donated them at low or no cost to a housing provider. Our fifth uh, strategic direction is adapting communities to climate change. Um, climate change adaptation strategies typically lay out the range of actions that will be taken to reduce flooding, stress on infrastructure, and disruption to everyday life from climate change. Our example is Ajax, which is on, in Ontario taking steps to ensure its adaptation strategy is properly in, implemented by embedding its provisions in planning instruments such as its official plan, development application review procedures, infrastructure assessments, and subdivision standards. Our sixth strategic direction is uh, enhancing green infrastructure and the role of semi-natural features in and near communities. Some communities are passing bylaws requiring new development to incorporate green infrastructure. Um, for example, Seattle's green uh, factor policy is built into the city's building code so that developers have to meet quantified green infrastructure standards as a condition for obtaining building permits for new residential and commercial buildings. An increasing number of municipalities are adopting urban forest master plans that advance policies for protecting trees or require developers to replace trees lost to development. For instance, Halifax's urban forest master plan proposes a suite of measures including tree planting, on public property, native tree selection, public education, and tree maintenance. Our seventh strategic direction is using market-based tools to encourage sustainable land use. So here we see a best practice around development charges that are, those are the fees that are paid by developers to municipalities to help pay for infrastructure, and they're increasing, increasingly being used to direct development into more sustainable patterns. For instance, uh, in the region of Niagara, there's a policy to discount development charges by up to 50% for development in targeted intensification areas that meet the region's smart growth design guidelines. A GHG offset program collects fees from development projects that reflect their emissions during construction or operation. And an example of this is Laval's greenhouse gas compensation program, which applies a charge on new development based on site size and they take the revenue from uh, those charges and use it to finance uh, climate change or other sustainability initiatives. And finally, under this strategic direction, um, as interest in redevelopment and intensif intensification mounts, municipalities across the country are coming up with incentive programs to overcome hurdles to brownfield redevelopment. Kingston's comprehensive brownfield incentive program is applied to large sites in the downtown area and includes tax breaks and grants to help developers cover demolition and decontamination costs. Our eighth uh, strategic direction is leveraging data related to land use sustainability. Ecosystem asset valuation reflects the increasing interest among municipalities to quantify the value of ecological services as a prelude to incorporating ecological features into asset management programs. Our case study, uh, we looked at Grand Forks in BC, where the municipality is assessing a natural asset, a river floodplain in this case, in terms of its monetary value and reducing flooding. Infrastructure costing and modeling tools enable municipalities to project the life cycle costs associated with the infrastructure needed to support different land use strategies, for instance, peripheral expansion over intensification. Prince George is piloting an instrument called the Community Lifecycle Infrastructure 
costing tool or CLIC for the acronym that estimates the in infrastructure life cycle costs entailed by different land use planning decisions projected over a 100 uh, year period. Energy density mapping brings together transportation, land use, and utility data to build heat maps of energy use across the community. Uh, Guelph piloted an energy mapping tool that could be used to identify problem areas to target with planning interventions or energy conservation programs. Growth scenario modeling lets the community see what the cost and quality of life uh, in implications are for alternative long-term growth alternatives. Uh, Calgary's growth scenario modeling exercise analyzed the capital and operating costs associated with two scenarios for urban growth, dispersed and compact. And our final strategic direction is enhancing public engagement in planning and mun municipal decision making. Municipalities are exploring ways to build support for smarter growth amongst the public, in particular to help overcome NIMBY reactions. In Quebec, the NGO called Viva en Ville, Living in Cities, offers municipality, uh, the municipality a public engagement service known as Yes in My Backyard that allows people to visualize higher density and mixed use neighborhoods. The service has been used by a number of municipalities uh, in Quebec, including the city of De Montagne in the context of a TOD planning process. A citizen assembly is a group of randomly selected people from the general public who advise governments on important public issues. In Vancouver, a city council asked the citizen assembly to plan an area around a sky, tra sky train station whose planning was mired in controversy and, and uh, they developed a very successful uh, neighborhood plan. Um, and then finally, the co-design of neighborhood retrofits involves citizens working with municipal officials to take advantage of an opportunity to improve the quality of life in a city or neighborhood. And our case study here was in Peterborough where a grassroots organization in a low income neighborhood worked with the city to add green infrastructure, public realm improvements and active transportation to a routine street reconstruction project. Back to you, John. For that overview, um, you've uh, gone through the, the content wonderfully. The, the report that we've put together, just so you know, really focused in on uh, best practices, and it's wonderful to see that there are so many. We also wanted to uh, look at some of the high impact, high impact best practices, as Ray had noted earlier, those that had high social, environmental, uh, and economic impacts in their communities. So there are slides for all 10 of these uh, high impact best practices. We don't have time to cover them all today, um, or really to dive into a lot of detail on each of them but I am gonna talk just briefly about three of them that are highlighted here. Sustainable neighborhood retrofit programs, uh, coordinating corridor and land use transit development, and carbon neutral mixed use uh, redevelopment. So the first, uh, the first example here, with, which is a sustainable neighborhood retrofit program, what this does is it looks at an existing neighborhood. And this example is from uh, Markham. This was a, a project with uh, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority who developed the SNAP program. And they worked with community members to develop a plan on how to make retrofit, uh, how, to, how to conduct uh, energy efficiency improvements within people's homes and the neighborhood in general to reduce, uh, to reduce water consumption uh, and reduce uh, water uh, flow into the, into the neighborhood. And with a long-term goal of, of moving towards net zero for both for water, energy, and, and waste emissions in the longer term. So this is really around engaging an existing neighborhood. And if, if we look at things from a greenhouse gas perspective, there's a lot of carbon that is tied up in existing neighborhoods, existing buildings that really needs to be addressed. And I, I know a number of municipalities are, are wrestling with this issue. The second example um, here is the corridor intensification, and, and Ray touched on this, and it, it's not only applicable to, uh, to the city of Saskatoon, but the municipalities are working on this right across the country. But what city of Saskatoon did is that they've developed these uh, nodes uh, within the, the corridor, within, sorry, the transportation corridor for the city, um, and have sort of implicated where development should ideally take place in the future. Um, which, which is something that the developers are, are working on as, uh, 
uh, as the development continues to unfold. And there are specific um, requirements that they've set within the corridor transformation plan to encourage different types of, uh, of development. Um, the case study or the examples uh, here, there's lots of there's lots of additional information on the website about each of these case studies as well. And the the fifth one uh, is really around uh, carbon neutral mixed use development. And although this this image is from Malmo, and I've had the pleasure in the past of visiting Malmo, it, it is a fantastic example. At the same time, I think it's really important to note that there are a number of projects that are moving in this direction in Canada. Uh, both in, in Edmonton uh, with Blatchford, uh, in Ottawa here with ZB, uh, some past projects in, in uh, Victoria with Dockside Green, we're approaching this. Um, these are real energy efficient communities, net zero, net zero communities, um, which bring sort of the best practices together from a, uh, from a walkability perspective, from uh, the built form, from a transportation perspective as well. So it's been nice to see the evolution of um, of the Malmo uh, project in, in Sweden. So that's a very quick overview of some of our, of our projects. Uh, we were asked today just to keep our time to around uh, 15 to 18 minutes. And by my stopwatch, we're just a few seconds over that. Um, a final, final thought, and this is very high, it's a high level conclusion, but there, there is a lot of, there's a lot of work that municipalities are doing. The impacts that we found from land use decisions really do have a profound impact on the environment, um, on society and the health of communities. And, and there's a lot of regional growth strategies that are being updated. And there's huge opportunities here to reduce emissions. So it's wonderful to see all of the projects that municipalities are working on across the country to address our social, in particular, our social and environmental challenges. I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much. And we'll make sure that everyone does get a copy of our, our slides afterwards. Thank you, Ray and John. That was a great overview of where Canada is headed with respect to uh, sustainable land use practices. And we look forward to going through a few questions after our next presentation. Now we will be hearing from Kaylin Anderson. Kaylin Anderson is a registered professional planner and planning director in the office of the chief planner at the city of Edmonton. She's currently she currently leads the preparation of the city plan, which provides direction for Edmonton's future growth and change and represents the provincially required municipal development plan and transportation master plan. Kaylin has worked for the city for 14 years in urban policy development, land use planning and intergovernmental affairs. She's the former vice president of, for the Council for Canadian Urbanism, an organization of city planners, urban designers, architects, engineers and developers that advocates for better city making across Canada. Kaylin, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Canada. It's uh, really nice here in Edmonton today. I hope that you're doing really well uh, from whatever region that you're watching this in. Um, today's kind of an exciting day to talk about the city plan. We actually released our draft city plan today and all of the technical studies are out, all of our mapping is out, all of our policies can be searched um, on a little Tableau platform. So really it's kind of, in addition to um, just being honored generally to be able to participate in this webinar, there's something kind of auspicious about the date on which this spells. So I'm, uh, I guess this is my bit, bit, bit of my pitch to say after this webinar, I hope that you rush, rush to your um, computer screen and, and look up Edmonton. So I'm going to just hopefully move us along properly. Aha, very good. I've got the technology working. So the introduction that, uh, or the overview that was provided by Ray and John is actually a really, really great segue into what I'll be covering briefly today, which is to talk about Edmonton's new city plan because we've really thought about this opportunity to create a new long-range comprehensive plan in a way that really does address all of our sustainability issues together in one place and ties them together in an integrated way. So before I get too far into um, describing what our current city plan, or our new city plan is gonna be about, I just thought I would set a tiny bit of context because I know people are, are, are watching from across Canada and might have different um, 
context within which they work. So in Alberta, we actually have to have a municipal development plan under our Municipal Government Act and a transportation master plan under our city's Transportation Act. But that's not enough of a reason to do these kinds of plans. Uh, it's also just kind of a, a great way of um, getting our community organized and taking the long view for where we want to be. So right now we do have these plans in place and they're separate documents. So we have um, a document called the way we move, which is our transportation plan and our growth plan is the way we grow. But we also have a people plan called the way we live, an environmental strategic plan called the way we green, uh, economic development plan called the way we prosper, and our um, financial plan, which is the way we finance. And all of this is uh, in service of our uh, community's long range uh, vision called the way ahead. So this is our current context. So there's a plan for everything. Uh, and we're doing something a little differently now, which I'll get into. So just last year, our city council adopted a new vision for Edmonton, and it was really about setting our sights on the kind of city that we're going to become. It sets the direction that we're going to be going together, and it changes the conversation for our community. So it's on the basis of this new vision that our planning system needs to fall into, into line and start to bring those choices that we need to make into sharper uh, relief. So the, the four new the new four goals of our city council are as follows: uh, that Edmonton is a healthy city, that it fosters urban places, that it supports regional prosperity, and that it ensures climate resilience. So right off the hop, you can see that this is pointing us in a direction where we have to be taking uh, sustainability from a variety of different angles very seriously and thinking about it in a comprehensive way. So I mentioned that uh, currently Edmonton has five different plans, all about different subject matters, and we're actually changing uh, our approach this time. So instead of having a plan that talks about one specific thing, whether it's transportation or the environment or, or what have you, instead we're trying to think about the jobs that our different documents serve and how to make sure that they do those jobs best. So we have our strategic plan, Connect Edmonton, which sets that direction. The city plan is gonna to bring together for the first time in a very long time, all of our um, issues and opportunities together into one place. And that's really articulating the choices that we will make together. The, the shorter term actions that we'll take are going, it's going to be articulated through an integrated uh, corporate business plan. And then of course we will do budgeting and uh, measuring and monitoring of all of that to make sure that we're uh, keeping ourselves uh, on track as we go. So our city plan uh, is going to be doing uh, a few key things. We really took it seriously in terms of trying to imagine um, what the plan had to do because if we didn't have a clear clear sight on that, line of sight on that before we started, it could have been anywhere and it could have been anything and everything. So we really wanted to sharpen our focus. So first of all, we really clarified, it has to do the job of um, bringing council's four goals to life. We also thought that we needed to have a, a really good spatial plan for Edmonton um, so that we can actually plan out those physical systems and networks that will allow us to grow, understand our infrastructure needs and uh, plan for the budgeting associated with that change. We also wanted the plan to be very evidence-based and measurable over time so that we could track things and also update our approach as needed. And this is an interesting one. We wanted to um, really call out what the big bold moves of the plan were going to be. So um, uh, a planner of Brit Renowned, who I have a lot of respect for out of Vancouver, Brent Hodderin, he wrote a really, really good piece in, I um, can't remember where which magazine it was in, but it was it was kind of a kind of an online, maybe it was well, it doesn't matter, I'll get it wrong. Anyway, he wrote a really good piece about how to build a city plan. And it was just kind of an easy to access um, little, little document. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me and with my team is he said, never play Where's Waldo with your big moves in your city plan. So if you have big moves to make, be clear about them, be honest, upfront, make them visible and make them trackable. So that's one of the things that we wanted to do. We didn't want to hide any of our big moves. We also wanted the plan to be really simple and easy to read and accessible for a lot of audiences. Um, you know, we, municipalities don't have the, the best reputation for writing really accessible plain language documents and it can be really hard to get a hold of or uh, you know hard to be inspired by if it's kind of jargony and really technical so we wanted to, to focus on that and finally we want to keep our, our long-range plan up to date um, which is kind of a different way of approaching things. So instead of creating a long range plan and then leaving it on a shelf and kind of the set it and forget it mode, um, we wanna bring this, this plan back to our council for updates every single year. And then at key milestones, we wanna revise it. 
So that's the basic premise. Um, public engagement and communications has played a much larger role in this process than I could have possibly imagined. So we've been working on the city plan for two years now. And when we were first setting out our project charter for how we were going get, to get this moving, we were thinking, okay, maybe 25% of our kind of financial and intellectual resources will go towards communications and public engagement. And I would say it's way closer to the 50% mark uh, and in the best way possible. Um, doing something like this um, really is, it's about um, changing the conversation, hosting new conversations, listening very carefully and making every possible effort to create opportunities for the uh, most diverse array of people to participate. So we uh, we really leaned into that. We worked really hard on it. and. Um, I noticed one of the, the best practices that uh, Ray mentioned was indeed public engagement. And I would just like to say as a practitioner who's just been through uh, 18 months of solid public engagement, I, can't, I couldn't agree more. Okay. Um, in addition, just to get ourselves in order, we had to make sure that we were also empirically uh, sound and we're doing the right thing. And so we were really, really lucky that we were able to work with people from across Canada um, to do a bunch of technical research and some study on different aspects of Edmonton's current state and possible future states. So we did a market study, we did a mass transit study, we did financial assessment, GHG emission assessment, climate vulnerability, and we even had somebody um, uh, work with us who was focused solely on what if all of these things are 100% wrong, uh, which was great. So planning for disruption. So we really did, we had people from Halifax, uh, Toronto area, Vancouver, et cetera, working with us uh, over the last 18 months to get all of our studies done. And then to start thinking about where we wanted to actually go as a community, we had to start to consider um, what our different options were. So as a starting point, we decided that we wouldn't plan for a different time horizon, like uh, 2040, 2050, 2060. Edmonton right now is about 1 million people. That's our current population. So we thought, what if we change the game a little bit here and we actually plan for a doubling of that population no matter which year it occurs. So that's what we're doing. We're planning for 1 million more. And as another kind of constraint in our process, we said, we're gonna plan to accommodate that population within our existing municipal boundary, which is a pretty big deal. So what we're saying is we want to double the population um, without continuing to annex uh, into our region, which has been a traditional kind of pattern in, in my community here in Edmonton, but also across the country, that's a, a fairly standard practice. So we wanted to not do it that way. So to figure out what that would mean for us, we did a variety of different learning scenarios where we um, changed uh, where population density would be, um, which mobility systems would be required to support it, and then to learn uh, what impacts that might have, both in terms of the financial cost to city and citizens, um, and GHG emissions, other things like that. So we developed uh, different learning scenarios. These were not um, three potential cities. All of them were equally unrealistic. We wanted to make them as exaggerated as we could so that we could take our learnings from them. So we had one, one scenario called Center City, one called Corridor City, and one called Node City. And then on the basis of these learnings, we came up with a preferred growth scenario, um, which, you know, in our studio here, which is where I'm sitting today, we sort of refer to as the greatest hits from all of our different learnings. So on the basis of this city plan concept, we were able to, um, this was based on both the public in input that we'd received and on this research, we were able to demonstrate that if we designed our city differently, we'd be able to achieve some pretty impressive um, outcomes. So here's a, 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 and I'll get to those in a moment, here's a, a kind of picture of one of the drafts, the early drafts of our city plan concept. You'll see that it's very, very dependent on a nodes and corridors development pattern, uh, which uh, both Ray and John mentioned uh, as, as a good practice, and, um, and it's supported from a mobility perspective um, with mass transit. Oops. There we go, kind of lost control of the mouse for a second. So if we develop in the way that we are planning to develop, here's the punchline, here's what we're gonna get out of the whole, the whole deal. 
we will save uh, more than 5,000 hectares of land from being developed prematurely because we won't need to use them because we're developing in a more compact way. We will actively support and enable redevelopment. Um, Ray mentioned that Edmonton currently has a target to reach 25% um, infill and we are going more, we're doubling that. We're saying we need to be at least 50% infill um, in ideally even more actually if we're going to be developing this way we will see a significant reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions as a community so six percent of reduction attributable just to transportation and land use we will in fact attract and retain another million people we will have better financial performance for our city and we will see our uh, walk bike uh, and transit trips go up uh, to 50 percent which is uh, very impressive indeed so I mentioned off the top that we didn't want to hide the big moves that we're making as a community. And so we literally have, if you go and check out the plan online, we literally have put those front and center in the draft plan. And what's more interesting about these big moves is actually that we've attached, we've attached stretch targets to them. So um, if you don't measure something, really, it doesn't get done. I know that sounds like a bit of a cliche, but we've truly found that to be the case. So if we want to make significant changes and transformations, we have to be clear about what that means, where we're going, and honest about the progress we're making or not making to get there. So we'll just zip through our, our big city moves. So the first one is that we become greener as we grow. And you can see that we have big targets around our carbon uh, budget, um, our GHG emissions, and our urban tree canopy. The next big city move is that Edmonton becomes a rebuildable city. So this means adding um, more than 600,000 people to the area that's already built up within the city and accommodating at least 50% of our new residential units as infill. We want to become a community of, a, of communities, um, which means that uh, at least 50% of our trips will be made by um, active transportation modes or transit. Um, and that we will be creating a series of 15 minute districts to allow people to meet their, their needs uh, completely throughout their, their day. The fourth city move is that Edmonton is inclusive and compassionate. So we wanna make sure that nobody's in core housing need, that there's no chronic or episodic homelessness. And we really wanna focus on keeping that individual affordability low. So it's not just good enough for the city to have a good fiscal per, um, position, but also we need to maintain affordability for individual residents, which in the, you know, for a large city in Canada is an increasingly uh, daunting challenge, but I think we're up to it. Finally, the last big city move is that Edmonton will be a place that catalyzes and converges talent and investments that uh, we can grow uh, and we can lead. Um, so we really want to maintain our share of uh, employment within our region. We want to strategically intensify jobs um, in, in keynotes and corridors and specifically to focus on an innovation corridor which connects the University of Alberta through downtown uh, right up to Nate, which is another post-secondary. So all of this isn't just about building, um, you know, great systems and networks. It's really about planning places for people. And we've tried to keep that at our core and to really remind ourselves about why, why we're doing all this work in the first place. It's not because we want trains and trucks and trees and tracks. It's because we want to help Edmontonians, both the ones who are here now and the ones coming later, to thrive. So to that end, we've organized the city plan in a very non-traditional way. We don't have chapters about transportation and urban design and you know, financial investment. Instead, we've organized the, the whole premise around planning for people. So you'll find uh, the chapters um, that we've created to be reflective of the guiding values of the plan. So I'll just quickly run you through what those are. The first chapter is that, that I want to belong and contribute. I want to live in a place that feels like home. I want opportunities to thrive. I want access within my city. I want to preserve what matters most. I want to be able to create and innovate. And all of this, all of the policies in the plan, will be brought to life through physical systems and networks. So I know that we only have uh, maybe two minutes left here on this component, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, but I'll walk you through uh, just some of our thinking so that you can see what I'm talking about. And ideally, if, it's, if that's enough of a teaser for you, you'll be uh, motivated enough to go ahead and look at the plan itself, which, as I mentioned at the top, is now available. So we've really thought about three systems. So the first is a planning and design system. And we're organizing our um, 
priority growth areas around nodes and corridors. We are also um, breaking our city up into 15 districts. We currently have about 350 neighborhoods. Um, that is way too many local communities to plan for in any kind of comprehensive way. So we want to think about these um, more holistically. We've considered and integrated very seriously our green and blue network. And we've identified our uh, non-residential opportunities for areas where we will experience employment growth. On the mobility side of things, uh, we have three major networks that we're considering. The first is our active transportation network. So this is biking and walking predominantly. The second is our mass transit network. This is going to be our people mover. Um, this is essentially how we're going to have to move people as we double our population. Um, we're, we're going to be going from 3 million to 7 million trips a day as we grow from 1 to 2 million, and we need a better way of getting around than single occupancy vehicles. And finally, our roadway and goods movement network is there to support our, our economy and the fluid flow of commodities and goods throughout our city. The city plan also thinks about how we need to coordinate and manage our growth really systematically so that we can ensure that we've got a good handle on what needs to happen when. So the networks we're considering from a high perspective are key development pattern areas. We've really simplified them. It's just redeveloping, developing, and future. We've also created um, uh, growth maps for uh, each population horizon. No city our, our city and no city would grow from 1 million to 2 million people uh, and it's kind of an unmanageable thing to consider but when you break it down into quarter million uh, person increments which takes about 10 years apiece in our context we can start, start to actually think about where that growth will happen and what kind of interventions we might need to undertake to best leverage that so we have both um, a growth heat map and a proposed activation approach for each, each of those time horizons and I sort of talked about this at the top, and my apologies that you really can't see this slide. I thought it would turn out better than it did, but it's okay. You can, again, one more reason for you to go look at the plan. Um, this is all, we have to tie all of this to measurement and monitoring, because if we don't measure what we're doing and we don't adjust our course, uh, we probably won't be able to hit these big targets, because what we're talking about here um, isn't just incremental change and improvement. In some cases, what we're talking about in the Edmonton City Plan is actually a leap that we have to make as we transform our community deliberately. So with that, thank you very much. I hope I've um, interested you to check out what Edmonton is doing. And um, I'm pretty ex um, excited to see that a lot of what uh, John and Ray talked about is integrated into our, our community's plan. And um, I hopefully it'll do us well. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, it was really great to hear about so many facets of the city's integrated planning and I think you've really provided a really great snapshot of what the city plan entails so thanks for your presentation so we have about less than 10 minutes remaining to tackle questions uh, from the chat function so i'll go right ahead and dive in I'll, I'll be alternating between questions related to the report and those more specifically about the the city plan so i'll start off with uh, ray and john um, since we do have quite a few smaller communities with us on the line today, you have provided a really great overview of sustainable land use practices across Canada, but could you speak a little bit more particularly about best practices that are more relevant to those rural communities in Canada? Yeah, I, I think I could um, take a stab at that. Um, we did do a uh, some sort of structured thinking about that uh, and we developed a table of all the best practices in which ones would apply to um, small, medium, larger communities. And um, we we arrived at the conclusion that, that most of the best practices that we discussed, the 26 best practices, would apply across the board, um, except uh, you wouldn't think that um, best practices that depended, for instance, on high rates of growth would apply to very small communities because many small communities in, in Canada are, are actually losing population. So um, uh, best practices like inclusionary housing strategy and growth scenario modeling might not apply that well um, to uh, very small or small communities. 
Um, you'd also think that uh, any of the best practices that relies on high quality transit, like uh, bus rapid transit or metro subways, light rail, et cetera, that uh, you know, clearly those wouldn't apply to very small communities or smaller communities that uh, would very likely lack that type of um, facilities. So uh, the best practices that fall into that would be cor uh, coordinating corridor land use and transit development and affordable housing on donated sites near high quality transit. But, but most of the other ones, uh, I would say, uh, and I, I, you know, in our discussions, I think we agreed would, would apply to, um, to smaller communities. John, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I think that's a great summary. Oh, sorry, my camera is off. And the, the issues are in rural communities are different. I, I grew up in a rural, uh, community, uh, farming community in Eastern Ontario. And I know that some of the practices I've seen locally are, are the innovations a little different. So we have a lot of new bus companies that are shipping people from the rural areas to work in, in the city. So it's a different type of, of transportation, but they're connecting in with the city's rapid transit uh, corridors. The energy efficiency practices, uh, we're seeing some pretty innovative buildings in, in different uh, rural areas across the country as well. Um, floodplain mitigation, uh, rural areas have a lot of, uh, depending on where it is, they have a lot of natural assets and they're, they're looking at uh, protecting those to help with some of the shocks uh, from extreme weather events. So there, there are a number, uh, certainly are a number of others and um, it, there's lots of good information up on the FCM website too about different uh, rural projects that have been supported and funded over the years too. Great, thank you both for that overview and for pointing out uh, one of the many resources we can find on the FCM website, um, which is really useful since we have a wide range of funded projects uh, in rural communities. So my next question is for Kaylin. A lot of people are really excited to hear about the public consultation process and public engagement. So could you speak and expand a little more on how uh, engaged, how you engage different populations and how that shaped the city plan? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> it, first of all, we worked with a really good team of professionals who have a lot of expertise in this area. So the first thing I would say is that public engagement isn't just creating posters uh, and standing in a, in a lobby of a, t a kind of town hall meeting, nor is it um, putting out some surveys. It, there's a lot of uh, great expertise that can be harnessed here. So the team that we worked with actually had a, a model that they were using where they looked at four segments of society from broad levels. So it was um, citizens, um, business, uh, uh, city, so the administration and civil society groups um, and, and others. So, so there was this model, This it was called the integral city model, and it was really to start to shape out who we were going to talk to in general to imagine that different perspectives would be there from a theoretical perspective. And then there was a lot of work done um, within that uh, to make sure that we were providing the maximum amount of opportunity for people to participate, whether it was really light touch engagement or really deep diving into workshops with us uh, across all segments of society. So so that took a lot of work. Um, we undertook a lot of very non-traditional approaches. So we actually went to where people were. One of my colleagues went to an evening basketball game uh, to, to connect with some younger men uh, to, to, to hear their perspectives. These are not the kind of uh, folks that you would probably typically see at a, an urban planning kind of a meeting. Um, we also worked really extensively with children and youth and we partnered with other groups uh, within our city to try to leverage this opportunity. We worked hard with uh, newcomer um, societies to make sure that we were tapping into newcomers and we uh, leveraged uh, religious groups so we were able to connect with mosques, etc. So in addition to the sort of typical things that you might see, um, kind of big workshops, charrettes, uh, building block exercises, surveys. We also did a lot of more intimate, small touch things where we could connect with people uh, on a more human level. And it was a ton of work. I won't, um, won't lie about that part. It was a ton of work, but it's been absolutely worth it. So um, one of my colleagues uh, who's an engineer on the project and maybe hadn't done 
as much public engagement in the past. One of his groups that he connected with was the local Bhutanese community. And uh, he had some really great reflections about just what it meant to sit kind of in the living room and have conversations. So even though I'm in a really big city, we didn't want to let that intimacy drop. And I think that with a little bit of concerted effort um, and commitment to doing that, it, it, it can be done and um, it can add uh, great value. And we have tons of also, again, plugging the, the, the website, but with all of our What We're Hearing reports are online, including our Indigenous Engagement Report, which is a whole separate engagement program that we undertook. Great, thank you, Kaylin. It's really great to see that you use different techniques and styles uh, for, for different people to get a wide range of responses. So we have not very much time left. So uh, we basically sent through the chat box the contact information of all three of the speakers. So if you have any specific questions, we encourage you to reach out directly to them. And another big thank you to Ray, John, and Kaylin for their time today. It was a really engaging session and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. There are a few final items that I'd like to mention before we close. The first one being the funding offer. So GMF funding uh, is available for all five sectors that I mentioned earlier in the introduction, including energy, transportation, waste, water, and land use. If we're looking specifically at land use, we do have um, a funding stream available for brownfields. So outlined on the table are the types of initiatives that we fund in this sector, but we also fund plans as well, including community brownfield action plans and sustainable neighborhood action plans as well. So I'd really encourage you to, uh, to take a look there and also contact our outreach advisors. So they're really here to help you make the most of this funding and to help you, whether you're at the initial planning phase or you know, you finished your feasibility study, they're there to help you and support you all along the way. So please make use of this contact information since they're the experts at in the funding available. So another reminder is to please join us next week on March 12th as we look at transforming the waste sector. We'll be hearing more specifically about waste management trends and different types of issues across uh, different size municipalities in Canada. And we'll also be profiling Canada's circular food economy, a partnership between um, Wellington and Guelph. So stay tuned, we'll be sending the link to register in the chat box. And before you go, we'd like to remind you how important it is for us to get your feedback in order to target our initiatives more to your, your needs and your interests. So please take a couple of minutes to fill out this participant feedback form once you leave the webinar. And that's all we have for us today. So thank you everyone for your time today. It's been a pleasure and thank you again to our presenters for uh, providing this great overview. So have a great afternoon. Thank you, Juliana. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Thanks, bye for now.